12. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up or uh, another part to the idea on how to deal with a narcissist about a month or so ago. And then another one was uh, exchange a cross for a crown. So both of those is kind of uh, attached with this idea this morning. And this is really how to uh, practice more so the second commandment rather than the first. First, love thy Lord thy God. The second, love thy neighbors thyself. So 2 Corinthians 12, and hopefully this gives us understanding about people and how we're supposed to respond Okay, chapter 12, verse 6. Okay, these people had kind of been griping at Paul about, like, the idea about prove, prove who you are, prove your apostle, blah, blah, blah. And he is uh, reluctantly answering those charges. And so in verse 6, he said this, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Okay, all these revelations that Paul was getting, a person uh, sometimes would admire him too highly. And so then the Lord, then he says here, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ <clears throat> may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Okay, I am become a fool in glory, and ye have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended you, or ought to have been commended of you. For nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Th truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand this idea. Help us to uh, know how to respond to the thorn in the flesh, thorn of our side. And I pray you'd help us to understand what Paul's talking about. And help us to be what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Paul had this request about removing this thorn in his flesh or thorn in his side. Asked the Lord about it three occasions, and it appears that God did not answer the uh, prayer in his desire. Okay, uh, unanswered prayer doesn't mean that God doesn't care. God has a different take on things. And even a wise parent will purposely withhold some things from your child because it's not in their best interest. Okay, and God's best interest for every believer is not specifically here on earth. His best interest is eternity. That's what he's looking at. So he's looking down the road and we're looking here on earth. And so we'll ask requests about things here on earth, but God's looking down the road. So he may or may not answer the request in our desire, but down the road it's in our best interest. Okay, in verse 7 he mentions this thorn in his flesh. Okay, the common saying is, uh, he's a thorn in my side. A thorn in your side is like a stone in your shoe. It gets your attention. Okay, but if you get a bunch of stones in your shoes, it's not a big deal as it have, as in, having one thorn in your shoe. Uh, uh, working in a grain bin, you get a, a kernel of corn in your shoe, and that thing's got your attention. But if you get a bunch of corn in your shoe, it all equalizes out. It it's not a big deal. Okay, now, what is this thorn in his, in his side that Paul has? Okay, the commentators almost all say that it was bad eyesight. Okay, but there's no evidence of that. That's just an opinion. And so if we go to the Bible, we might discover what the thorn in his side is. And I do believe that we can. And um, a few weeks back, I taught on our behavior, how we are to respond to uh, scornful people or 
uh, the common word would be narcissism or a pathological narcissist. And unfortunately, it's becoming an epidemic. But that's a sign of the Lord's coming. So we're not, we're not uh, fretting about that. It's just how do we respond properly in a Christ-like manner to these situations? Okay, and that often becomes a cross in a person's life. And that can be, a, in, in many cases, a family member that is a constant cross or a hindrance in our Christian life. But then that cross can be exchanged for a crown at the judgment seat. Okay, and that's what the old rugged cross was all about. And so how do we learn to respond properly, uh, first to God, about this thorn in our side, where he says, no, I'm not going to take it away, and then how do we respond to the thorn? And so I'm going to give you some thoughts about this. These are ideas of, regarding personal relationships. Maybe somebody in the job that you're working with is a thorn in your side. Maybe it's a family member, a cousin, a relative, husband, wife, whatnot, or just somebody you uh, come across every once in a while. The first thought is this, okay, this thorn of verse 7, a thorn in the flesh, the thorn appears to be a person or people influenced by Satan. And now the reason why I say that, okay, in the verse, if you read it, okay, and if you can remember your English class, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was Given, okay, their subject was given, verbs, to me a thorn, direct object, in the flesh, comma, a, the messenger of Satan. That's an appositive, renaming or describing the noun. Okay, uh, he said to Bill, comma, my brother, comma, and then the rest of the sentence. Okay, the impositive is not necessary. You can still say, he said to Bill, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but the, the appositive is describing, giving additional information about the subject. The subject here is the messenger, or the appositive is the messenger of Satan. Uh, there's no place in the Bible I know of where bad eyesight is called the messenger of Satan. Okay, so the messenger of Satan appears to be a person or people that are influenced by Satan. I'm not saying they're saved or lost. The messenger of Satan can be an unclean spirit or devil that indwells a man or woman. Okay, in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. Now, principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness use flesh and blood to get their means across. So in our wrestling or struggles with people in an argument or debate or whatever, we're dealing with a flesh and blood person, but there's a spirit inside them that you're wrestling against. But a lot of people will focus on the flesh and blood and pop it so more blood comes out, and they think they feel better about themselves. Okay? It's not that. It's not the person. It's not flesh and blood. It's the spirit inside that we're wrestling against. Now, that individual can be a good person, can be a bad person. It doesn't matter. Uh, Satan used Peter and Judas to resist Jesus Christ. Both men. Peter, a good man. Judas, bad man, or a devil, in fact, what the Bible calls him. Both gave, both were given thoughts by Satan to resist something that Jesus Christ was intending to do. Okay, with Peter, Jesus Christ said to him, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, suffer, blah, blah, blah. And then Peter said, no, that's not going to happen. And then he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Okay, that was, at that time, a resistance to what Jesus Christ was going to do. Then Judas uh, Iscariot betrayed him. Okay, and so both of those men, good man, bad man, were used by Satan to resist something of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, the Lord Jesus read right into it and knew he wasn't arguing with Peter, flesh and blood. He was dealing with the spirit that came through Peter. Now, we know from history that Peter uh, had godly repentance, and then the Lord used him greatly, and Judas Iscariot had fake repentance, and then died a suicide. So, this idea of these cases of thorns in the Bible... Okay, if you run through the Bible, look up the word thorn. Numbers 33, verse 55 is the first occurrence. 
And so what you do is when you define Bible words, you run to the Bible to get the word defined. And amazingly, it's done in English. Okay, Numbers 33.55. Okay, Paul said uh, there's a thorn. He's got a thorn in his side. And he says, comma, the messenger of Satan. Numbers 33.55, Paul, or, uh, the Lord said to Moses and the Israelites, he said, but if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides. That's the Canaanites. So that would be unbelievers. Okay, and that, that idea says the thorns in your side and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. And they had to put up with that. Okay, that's mentioned two other places. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 6, in this passage, the thorns in the individual's side was David. And this one is called, But the sons of Belial shall be of all of them as thorns thrust away. Again, in this context, sons of Belial, sons of the devil, these thorns are, again, evil people. Okay, so they're unbelievers, like the ones in the Canaanites, unbelievers. So we got unbelievers. And then Solomon mentions the laughter of a fool. It's like the crackling of thorns. So he just throws that idea out. Now, if you would try Micah, if you can find that, Micah chapter 7. Now, Micah is, is describing an epidemic of thorns, meaning... The closer we get to Christ's coming, the more bizarre behavior people will demonstrate, and it will be an epidemic of thorns or an epidemic of narcissists. And it'll be everywhere. And once you learn some of the characteristics, you're going to start seeing, I'm surrounded. <laughs> you're going to feel that way. And that's the signs of the time. That's the signs of the second coming, which is a blessing. Okay, Micah 7, verse 4, Micah is describing some things about the future events. 7, verse 1 through 7 is a context. In verse 4, he says, the best of them, that's the best of the people, is as a briar, the most upright, is sharper than a thorn hedge. He said, the best of the people are thorns in your sides. And we're seeing society become that way. The world's getting that way, and it ain't getting better. The only way it's getting better is the Lord comes back and he starts fixing things. That's an epidemic. Now, this idea of these thorns is mentioned in Hebrews 6, 8, and we know that's a prophetic. Hebrews 6, 8 says he's going to take these thorns and throw them in the fire. Okay, now, in those contexts, the thorns are unbelievers that become thorns in the side of believers. In Luke chapter 8, the thorns here are believers, are carnal believers who become thorns in the side of believers trying to do right. In Luke 8, you have uh, four different types of recipients of hearing the words of God. And Jesus described this sowing a seed. The first two uh, recipients seem to be lost or unbelievers, and the last two are believers. And in verse uh, 14, he describes the ones that are thorns. Luke 8, 14. And they which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked. The word is choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So that'd be carnal believers. And then verse 15. But that on a good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with unto patience or with patience. That would be believers. Now, isn't it interesting that on Calvary, the Lord had a crown of thorns beat on his head? And so these thorns are um, things that are normal in life. And so we have to know how to react to that. Okay, the second thought is this. An epidemic of thorns. Okay, which will result in worldwide violence. But an epidemic of thorns reveals the final days. Okay, or the closeness to the last days. Okay, if you would, Second Timothy chapter 3. Uh, Paul described this to Timothy. 
And there's an interesting connection here with Moses. So as it was in the days of Noah, so shall be in the days of coming Son of Man. And then some of the same things that Moses experienced. And this, this thorn is similar to the cross that a person bears. Remember in Matthew 12, the Lord likened the cross that one bears to the, to the differences or the division between family members. That's the first likening of a cross where a lot of times we think our persecution is coming from an outside source. No, it might be somebody in the same house. Okay, grandparent. And it's a cross that we bear. And, and the, the old rugged cross says that we're going to exchange our cross for a crown. Now, the same idea comes with this thorn. The, the word thorn, and if you take the letters and just jumble them up and then throw an E in the end and you have a throne. Same letters. You just throw the E on the end. So it's just like where the cross, we exchange a cross for a crown, we exchange a thorn for a throne. Okay, with the Lord at the judgment seat. Now in 2 Timothy, he's describing this in verse 1. This this know also that in perilous times shall come in the last, or uh, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then he starts describing people. Lovers of their own selves. And you read down through that list, that will be the end result of a pathological narcissist. And then if you drop down to verse 8, notice there were two guys that were thorns in the side of Moses. Janus and Jambres. Okay, and it says about Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. Now, I don't know if these were the magicians where the New Testament names, it doesn't name him in the Old Testament. Okay, if it was the magicians, of course, they died or got away from that as a result of the Red Sea crossing everything. If it was a Jew, okay, maybe like Korah and Dotham, where God delivered Moses from Korah, Dotham, and Abiram, but maybe Janus and Jamri was always hanging around. Their ministry was always to second-guess Moses. You know, that's what, like, that's like a mother-in-law with her son-in-law. Okay, always got a second guess. Okay, but here they are. But there's an, also another word associated with these two guys. Now, Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate. There's another word, reprobate, concerning the faith. Now, they were reprobate about a certain topic. You ever talk to somebody or have a relationship with somebody and there's a taboo topic you couldn't talk about? And if you do, eyes get glassy. Don't want to discuss it. Reprobate concerning that or closed-minded. Okay, reprobate carries a, is a greater definition of that. But a reprobate person here in this context is a thorn in one side. Okay, and the Bible likens reprobate people to, or reprobate silver, and he likens it to thorns. Now, a reprobate is associated with the description of a narcissist or sociopath or psychopath. Now, the Bible word, it, it appears to me that the Bible word for a pathological narcissist, okay, now when you describe the characteristics of a narcissist, Somebody will have these characteristics, and all of us have some of these characteristics. Even as a child we grew up, we had characteristics of a narcissist. Okay? And, and, and you travel on that road, but the idea is hopefully we exit that road and get on a different road sometime in life and become more healthy in our viewpoints about things. But when a person stays on that road, the end game is a reprobate and a proud scorner. Okay? A reprobate about everything. Okay, and so that's where we're heading on the idea of this. And how do we handle these things? Okay, if you describe the characteristics of narcissism to a pathological narcissist, the answer is going to be, I know everybody's acting like that but me. They don't accept it. Why? Because the world revolves around them. Okay, now we go back to, I'll give you a brief definition of a narcissist or a pathological narcissist. 
uh, going back from a month ago. Remember, the key thing is they have a grandiose view of oneself with the motivation of self-preservation of their feelings. To their pathological narcissist, his feelings are facts. No matter what you say, don't confuse me with the facts. I've got my mind made up. Okay? They have a sense of entitlement. The world revolves around them. They need admiration or attention. And they lack empathy. They have, they have no empathy for people in their lives. People in their lives are nothing but props, tools, or punching bags. That's how they view it. Okay? The narc has no feelings at all for the person he abused. They, they don't see there any problem with that. And they view it just like anybody who would view a punching bag. Okay, you use a punching bag, you blow off steam, you get all the way to sweat. Man, I feel better. But you don't feel sorry for the punching bag. A, a, a narcissist who is a pathological narcissist will use a loved one as a punching bag and walks away, feels better about themselves, and they have no concern about that individual. Walk away from it. Now, when a person is like that, the ideal position for you and I to be is to walk away and stay away. But you can't do that all the time. What's the Bible authority for that? People say, well, you need to love others. If God gives up on him, who am I? God gave up. And he tells us in Romans chapter 16, he says, Mark them which cause offenses contrary and divisions contrary to doctrine. And then he says, and avoid them. That's a Bible command. Okay? And so there are some cases where we need to do that. But then there are cases where you cannot. And that's where we step into the realm where I taught back then about calmly scorner, scorner. And you go through the Proverbs and you find those certain Proverbs that I laid out there. And that's how we respond to that. But if you would, let's go to Romans 1 and we can see the path to a reprobate mind. What would cause this idea of a pathological narcissist? Again, if you describe these terms and a person says, I have some of those characteristics, that person, in my mind, we have hope. They can change. Why? Because they are honest about themselves. But a pathological narcissist, there ain't no hope. God gives up on them. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and 32 is the path down. And you read some of these characteristics, you can go down through there. Okay, and in verse 1 it says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men. And notice, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. This person might hold the Bible, might attend church and things like that, and might be a fundamentalist or whatnot, but he holds the Bible for what he gets out of for his personal self because everything revolves around him. God exists for his pleasure. Holds the truth and unrighteousness. That verse changed in every new Bible. Why? It's because the men who were the revisionists were reprobates concerning final authority. They might have been good men. They might be godly men or all in other areas. But regarding final authority, you can't deal with these people. I've tried on many occasions. But they're still good people, but on that issue, they're, they've been blinded. Okay, and then if you re keep reading down, you notice in verse 21, it says, neither were thankful. They lack gratitude. Why? They're entitled to it. They are entitled for you to be their punching bag. So they have no gratitude. Their gratitude's gone. It's lost. Okay, and this is where, during the Clinton administration, he changed government handouts to what? Entitlements. That's why America's become a narcissistic society. Who would vote for a narcissist like Hillary Clinton? A bunch of narcissists would. And think the world revolves around them. Okay, and then in verse 25, they change the truth of God into a lie. That verse is changed in every new Bible. Okay, so these are some of the characteristics. And what happens? Verse 26, God gave them over. God gave up. God gave up. 
This is why he blew Sodom and Gomorrah off the map. Both cities, plus Adam and Bozer, all those cities were overrun by narcissists, pathological narcissists, where they could kill their own mother and justify the reason for doing it. She didn't do what I told her to do. Like a 16-year-old kid I read one time where mom wouldn't give his keys. He's 15. Mom wouldn't give him keys to drive the car. She don't got a license. So what did he do? He helped and killed her. In jail, probably for go, what's wrong, gone wrong? The world revolves around me. Okay, and that's the path they're traveling down. Okay, this thorn in the thigh, Janus and Jambres, reprobate. In Titus 1, verse 15, this is when it becomes a, an epidemic in society. Titus 1, 15, under the pure, all things are pure. But under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. Okay, in our culture, if a church has to debate the issue of a gay pastor, they are for, so far gone down, they might as well just put him in a grave and put a shovel over, you know, the dirt over him. I mean, that is a non-debatable issue. But when a society is infected with it, it becomes debatable. Every good work, reprobate. Profess that they know, oh, I believe in God. Well, yeah, you probably do. But what about this and that? Okay, and so now Paul reveals in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 the Christian aspect where, yes, a believer can be a reprobate in some way or in some fashion. So, in this portion is a person, a person might say to himself, man, I, there's no hope for me. Yes, there is. When you recognize there's a problem, there is. And so 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us how we can overcome these areas. And this is where a child grows out of it, hopefully to become a healthy relationship with others. And what do they need to be taught? A uh, Verse 5, examine yourselves. Okay. Be willing to examine yourself honestly and be willing to allow other people to examine you and to point out blind spots in your life. If somebody criticizes you, can you walk away from it and say, I need to consider that. Okay, I'm going to consider that. I ask the Lord, okay, is that true, Lord? Is that was okay? Okay, yeah, I need to, okay, I should change that. Yeah, yeah, okay. If a person can be honest with themselves... If a person just rejects it and say, how dare you? Don't you realize I'm right about everything? Okay, you're dealing with a pathological narcissist. Okay, so examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Honesty. Being honest. That has to be taught to children. Teach them to be honest. What we would do in our house, you know, a couple of kids getting debating, arguing about something, you know, which one's right, which one's wrong. Then mom and dad comes in and says, okay, uh, let's hear the thing. Okay, we hear the thing. Okay, you're right and you're wrong. Now you say it. Say it. I was wrong. You were right. Well, I hated doing that. But that was an admission. It was teaching honesty. I mean, you've got to admit when you're wrong. If people don't admit when they're wrong, man, oh man. Okay? And the thing is, is honest. It, it, I find it interesting, the word honest not in all cases, but in most cases, removed from the new Bibles. Okay, and so a person has to develop honesty about themselves, about their behavior. Was I right or wrong? Okay, so when one can acknowledge and admit his tendencies toward narcissism, he can overcome them by getting off that road and jump on the highway of honesty, being honest about things. Did I change that word of the Bible? Did I twist the scripture? Did I add to? Did I stretch it out further? 
Okay, being honest. Don't add to, don't subtract from. Because when you start adding to, subtracting from these words, when are you going to start and stop? So we're honest about that. Never change the words, never corrupt the words. We come to the Bible with a clean slate saying, Lord, I want you to show me some things that if I need, if it's going to kick me, I want to take it. If it's going to help me, I want to, I want, whatever it's going to take, I, I want to change what I believe to match the Bible. Okay, then what do we do? We grow in faith and grace. God, give me grace. Give me grace. Now that's a, a, an idea. Grace and mercy, according to Hebrews 4.16, you can demand God for that, and God is obligated to give it. Okay? And that's... I don't believe you can demand God for certain things. You know, take this thorn on my side. Blah, 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 blah. No, but we can say, Lord, you got to give me the grace. I cannot live this Christian life. You want me to live it. I can't do it unless you give me grace and mercy. Therefore, I'm coming boldly to the throne of grace to get it. Okay? So that's something we come to the throne of grace for. Okay? And we grow in faith and in grace... And then we're very, we're, we become accountable about our words. We were very careful about our words that we express to people. Okay, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, 9, and 10, it says, be courteous. Be courteous. And then he says, and speak a blessing, and you'll inherit a blessing. Are our words... Uh, encouraging to others? Now, I know there's time to get a rebuke. I understand all that stuff. But generally speaking... We need to be accountable about the words that we express to people. Okay? Do we rub the fur in the wrong way? Okay? Yes, there's times you gotta do that. Okay? But we have to, there's times you gotta, uh, earn that respect also. Colossians chapter 3. So a person needs to put on this. Okay? Uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. And again, this is dealing with our personal relationships with people. A 3 verse 12, he says, Put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. Okay, remember, a pathological narcissist has no mercy. They lack empathy. So bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Aren't you glad in the New Testament, in the church time period, your forgiveness is not based on your forgiveness of others? I know the Lord said that in Matthew, but our forgiveness should be based upon what Christ forgave us. And then he says this, above all these things put on charity which is a bond of perfectness. Now, he doesn't define charity there. You go back to where he defines it. Charity is not love by itself. Love by itself is an emotion. Charity is love in action within a Christian setting. It's a higher quality. And a person needs to examine themselves on their charity. And when you read the full definition, chapter 4, or chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians um, 13, 4 to 7, you're going to recognize, okay, I think I need to work on my charity. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Now, charity, it's no problem suffering long, but is kind. He did have to throw that P.S. in there, didn't he? I thought it would be, you suffer long, but you got to put up with it. You can grumble throughout the process. In the Greek, if you really study the Greek, I'm sure you'll get it there. If you want to play the Greek game, go to Strong's Recorders, and I'm sure you can find a definition. That's what they do. Just join the game. Okay, no, he said, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. There's the sense of entitlement. The opposite of it. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Okay? Around a pathologi pathological narcissist, you can say something all of a sudden, boom! You say, what did I say? They will blow up on the most amazing things. And how did we get here? And then when you try to, to, 
Then when you explain yourself, it will be turned on you 180. It's amazing how it's done. And the only thing that can do that are spirits. Man's not smart enough. Spirits are. And they will shift that. That's why you got to walk away from it. No explanation. you got to calmly scorn the scorner and follow that procedure. So you humbly consider the insights of others. Okay, the third idea again is this. Okay, we got that thorn in the flesh. You've asked the Lord to remove it. He says no. Learn from it. The third thought is this. God, I, God desires ideal perfection for every believer at the judgment seat. That's what God desires. That's what God's looking at. We're looking at now, now, and we're doing this for one of two reasons. One is obviously it's just life. We'd like to make life more convenient for us. But the other is in this TV age, Okay, you may, if you watch certain videos or certain movies, even the Christian movies, doesn't it, is it not true they almost always have a happy ending on earth? I mean, it'd be 10 to 1. What about the martyrs? Oh, they would say that's tragic. It's tragic from our viewpoint, from Jesus Christ's viewpoint, it's not. Why? Because he gets the glory. So we had this mentality was we want to have the happy ending on earth. And then they'll throw the idea, oh, all things, brother, sister, all things work together for good to that love the God them who are the called according to their purpose. And I agree, I believe that. But that context is the judgment seat. Because in verse 18 he says, our sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. And so, yes, I I believe a person ought to pray that the thorn or the cross is taken away. But if the Lord takes that cross or thorn away, guess what? It's going to be a different one. Because we're not going to get that resurrected body until that judgment seat. And so we learn to grow. We get stronger. And we walk with the Lord closer. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. He throws the same idea. The same idea, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Where he says this, for our light affliction. Now, we may say it's not a light affliction. We will then. Now, it's not a light affliction. But our light affliction, which is but for a moment, but from our per- perspective, when it's in that, it seems to be in eternity... It's but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and ex- eternal weight of glory. That's the judgment seat. That's what the Lord's looking at. 2 Timothy 2.10 is the same idea. 2 Timothy 2.10, and then he's got another one for the Jews in the tribulation in 1 Peter. But 2 Timothy 2.10, it says this. Paul said, therefore, I endure all things. For the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. So some folks are glad they're saved, and that's all they're glad about. But the sentence did not finish there. With eternal glory. The Lord is not only glad for the salvation of the soul, that's not just his goal. He wants that he's his will is that you get saved and Come to the knowledge of the truth. That's his goal. Okay, and so his goal is for the best day for you to be at the judgment seat. And so when we got these thorns here, okay, we got these crosses here. Yeah, we ask the Lord to help us, uh, ask the Lord to remove them, but the Lord may say no. And then we ask the Lord for grace and mercy to know how to deal with it. And we ask the Lord for wisdom to know how to respond properly. Okay, because that better prepares us for the judgment seat of Christ, where we can exchange a cross for a crown and a thorn for a throne. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to uh, understand this idea, and as this world gets uh, nuttier and nuttier, crazier and crazier, and uh, people become more like this, that you'd help us to realize that that's what Noah put up with. Over a hundred years he put up with that. That's what Enoch was talking about. This ungodly, 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 as he said. And you took him out of it. But yet you had Noah endure it. 
And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be faithful to thee and help us to know how to respond, help us to learn from it, help us to grow in faith, in grace, and help us to be faithful to thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.